Hello and welcome to the fifth Arthroplasty Dialogues episode. This time, we have moved to a video platform to make the complex and controversial topic of kinematic alignment easy for our viewers and our guest is none other than the pioneer himself dr stephen howell dr howell is a board certified orthopedic surgeon practicing in sacramento and lodi he completed his medical degree at northwestern university and then completed his orthopedic residency at thomas jefferson university he joined adventist health lodi memorial with more than three decades of experience as a clinician, researcher, and innovator in total knee replacement, ACL reconstruction, and meniscal surgery. Dr. Howell has trained physicians on five continents and worked together with industry experts to offer the exciting approach to total knee replacement called kinematic alignment. This alignment method for TKR is an innovative technique he developed in 2005 to improve placement of implants, resulting in more consistency and reliability in patient outcomes. Importantly, this approach also allows for shorter lengths of stay and quicker return to prior function. In the field of ACL reconstruction, Dr. Howell is the designer of the 65 degree TBL guide and easy lock or washer lock ACL reconstruction system for Zimmer Biomet Sports Medicine. He is also a consultant for Biomet Sports Medicine and has developed instrumentation and implants for ACL reconstruction, which are not only used nationally, but also internationally. For the last 24 years, Dr. Howell studied the biomechanics of the knee at the University of California, Davis, as an adjunct professor of biomechanical engineering. These investigations have led to the publication of more than 140 scientific articles that advanced the understanding and treatment of patients with degenerative arthritis of the knee, ACL tears, and meniscal tears. He is a retired military professional who also served the country during critical times such as Operation Desert Storm. When not seeing patients or operating, Dr. Howell likes to fly fish and play a bit of golf. He stays active by walking, swimming, and cycling. Dr. Howell, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, Dr. Singh, well, that was a wonderful introduction. I wasn't sure who you were talking about. <laughs> That's just your <laughs> humility. <laughs> <laughs> so without wasting any time, let's get started. And first of all, there are a lot of myths, apprehension, and confusion surrounding kinematic alignment. And what we aim to deliver through this interaction is a clear understanding of the basics of kinematic alignment that would enable our viewers to gain clarity with regards to the fundamental concepts. So getting started with this topic, can you first tell us what are the three kinematic axes of the native knee joint? Great, I've uh, put a couple and slides And what together, we aim to deliver so through this interaction is a clear theory. understanding yeah. of the basics of so kinematic, the alignment of kinematic alignment that would it's, enable it's our really viewers to gain clarity with regards to we'll the fundamental the concepts. The <clears throat> so getting started with this topic, most important can you first tell us what are the three kinematic axes of the native knee joint? And uh, as I'll show Great, you, I've how put to a use couple it. slides. And what we aim to deliver also, through this interaction is a clear understanding yeah, the of the basics of so the kinematic alignment. So, the patients, pre arthritic joint lines, and three kinematic axes without releasing healthy ligaments. So, if we look at this schematically, there are some medial and lateral poses of the distal femur, and then a, a coronal and axial view. And if you look at the green line, is the line in the femur the axis in the femur about which the tibia flexes and extends. And you'll see from the uh, medial and lateral projections in the sagittal view, it goes through the center of best fit circles applied to the uh, femoral condyle from 15 to 120 degrees. So the knee is really uh, you know, a wheel. And uh, so that's one axis. And then the second axis is parallel to the first and about 10 millimeters anterior and proximal. And that is the axis about which the patella flexes and extends. 
and we'll talk about who discovered these in just a moment. And then there's a longitudinal axis in the tibia about which the tibia internally and externally rotates on the femur. So these are the three axes. There's not two, there's not one, there's not four, there's not five, there's three. And what is critical about all three of these axes is they are either parallel or perpendicular to the native joint line. So if you take an implant and simply resurface it, the knee back to its pre-arthritic joint surface, then by definition, if the implant is designed to function and is morphologically shaped like a native knee, then the kinematic should be pretty close, even though you're missing the ACL. And we like to retain the PCL. So it's simply a surface fitting. And so any technique that tilts the implant with respect to the VV proximal distal, i.e. anterior posterior uh, position of the native joint line will cause kinematic conflict where ligaments will be tight when they shouldn't be. They'll be loose when they shouldn't be. If you're off a degree, millimeter, it's probably tolerable, but you know, people that do fracture work would never accept an intraarticular displacement of two millimeters. They don't even want to accept one. And yet we throw those principles out the window when we do total knee and we say, oh, we'll put it any way we want and let the implant do the work. And so our view is that's not the way it should be. So if we then look at the three landmark axes, the first one, and you can look this up, it's core 93, the axes of rotation of the knee, and Hollister as a hand surgeon came up with this. We've known this for 20 some years now, uh, 20, 30 years, huh? Th almost 30, 29 years we've known there's a single axis. And I'll bet you that most people didn't know where it was found, but it's there. And, and, and that has a very profound influence on how we align components. We're indebted to Coughlin in 2003. That's 20 years ago. We knew about the axis about which the patella flexes and extends. And that has been firm, confirmed later on by Aranpour uh, out of Imperial College. So these have all been substantiated through additional research. And then Michael Freeman, 2005, defined that the IE axis passes through the center of the medial femoral condyle a, a little bit posterior to the midline on the tibia and enables ball and socket movement. So if you suspend the knee with your implants in and internally and externally rotate it, you'll find it actually pivots around an axis in the middle of the knee because the joint's not compressed. But when it's compressed, it's a medial pivot. And that's because the medial meniscus and the coronary ligament firmly are connected to the medial border of the tibia, which gives it a socket. And, uh, and that I think kinematically is what we want to restore. So this means that the axis of the patellofemoral and the femorotibial flexion are more or less parallel to each other. And both of these are perpendicular to the axis of the femorotibial rotation. Is that right? That so, is correct. And, and parallel, you know, the, the transverse axes are both are parallel, parallel to the distal and posterior joint lines of the femur. <laughs> okay. So thus it seems only logical that we need to reproduce this in our arthroplasty surgery. So mm. how does kinematic total knee arthroplasty restore this alignment? Because also a lot of surgeons believe that kinematic alignment only means putting the knee in varus because of the average three degree lateral tibial inclination or the medial proximal tibial angle, which is 87 degrees. So can you just tell us in brief how the procedure differs from mechanical alignment procedure? Yes. So let me, uh, maybe I share another couple of slides, huh? Can we do that? Yes, sure, sure. So. Um, so, you know, you asked me about an animation. This is one that has been uh, pre-recorded, but it's one that has sort of a varus uh, deformity, if you will, with cartilage missing medially. So maybe this will give us a little idea of, uh, in a short period of time, what the technique is. Tours the pre-arthritic condition, starting from the femur, compensating for cartilage wear to reference the native joint line and cutting exactly the implant thickness on the two condyles, both distally and posteriorly, which resurfaces the femur and aligns the component to the cylindrical axis. Once femoral preparation is completed and the implant is positioned on the bone, the native femoral articular surface is restored. Every step can be verified by measuring the resected bone. On the unworn side, this equals the implant thickness minus one millimeter of saw blade curve. On the worn side, another two millimeters of missing cartilage should be considered and subtracted. 
So, you know, for the surgeon that um, is interested in doing kinematic alignment, then um, to set up the femoral cuts, you need to know uh, the thickness of the condyles. So you can go to your implant manufacturer and ask them how thick is your distal uh, uh, femoral condyle and your posterior femoral condyle. And they sometimes change as your size changes. Um, but once you have that, then you can do the computation uh, for the resection thickness that you need to resurface the joint. And, uh, and if you're there and you forget what the numbers are, you can always put your caliper down and measure the thickness of the implant with your caliper. So in this particular case, uh, the distal resections, the total amount of stuff removed, including the curve of the blade and any cartilage missing should be nine millimeters. So the entire amount of material removed should equal nine so that you restore the joint surface. So if you have two millimeters of cartilage, you'll subtract that from nine millimeters to get you down to seven. And you have a curve of the blade where the bone dust is, disappears, you'd be six. So when you say I've got a varus knee with two millimeters of cartilage missing, or let's say there's only a millimeter cartilage missing distal medial, then just take a curette and take it down to bone. And when you cut that piece and you measure it, you say, oh, that's six millimeters. Add a millimeter for the, for the curve of the blade, seven. Uh, add back two uh, for the cartilage. You've got nine. So you've done your job. And then posterior resection should equal eight. So the whole computation is just account for the thickness of the blade. And even though it's 1.2 millimeters, we assume it's one and two millimeters for the cartilage. And it gets you really close to the neighborhood of where you want to be. And that's the whole planning of the operation is just that, uh, just looking at the implant thickness. So any varus knee that I see, for the most part, until proven otherwise, the distal medial cuts six, the distal lateral cuts eight, the posterior cuts are seven. Any valgus knee I see is usually the distal lateral cut six, the posterior lateral cut, I worry a little more uh, that there's cartilage wear and I'll flex that knee up, stick a little knife blade in that posterior cartilage. And if it's missing, I have a two millimeter shim, I'll put on my posterior referencing guide, which is set at zero. <laughs> And then that'll displace the posterior foot two millimeters to account for the cartilage. And then my plan there is to resect seven or five. So I will make that posterior lateral cut first, pull the piece out and measure it. And I'll say, hmm, it's five. And I'll take a knife. Oh my goodness, there really was cartilage there. I should have taken seven. Mm -hmm. Well, then I'll pull the pin out of that four and one block and rotate it two millimeters more anterior on the lateral side, pin it again. And I'll take another two off to make the correction. I'll do my posterior medial cut. And then I'll do my anterior and chamfer cuts. And you can fine tune and walk that four and one block around the way you need to, uh, to get everything just the way you want. So you're spending your time on that femur uh, to get those four cuts right. That's the operation. Okay. So basically the thickness of the implant should match how much you're removing plus the curve of the blade. So that's basically the mathematical equation we're yep. looking at. And, and the cartilage loss, which is two millimeters, as long as you've scraped it down to bone. Okay. So here's how we do the operation. Now, this is a different knee, and this knee does not have uh, cartilage where it medial, it's a varus knee, but the cartilage is missing distal medial. So we have a distal referencing guide, says worn and unworn. On the worn side, posterior to that surface is a two millimeter buildup to account for the cartilage thickness. And we just assume everybody has a cartilage thickness of two. It could be 1.5, it could be 2.5, but the average is actually 1.8. So we correct two. And then to get the, the uh, cuts correct, we compress the guide to the femur with these screws. Mm -hmm. So this step plans and executes the operation at the same time with no imaging studies. That's why it's more accurate than the robot. It will always be more accurate than the robot for getting the cut because we accept the fact that even when we do this, we might miss our target. And I'll show you that we miss it less than a robot does. But when we do, we have a plan in place to correct it. If we miss our target by half millimeter, okay, that's what happens. One millimeter, if we don't, if we want to get a six millimeter distal resection and we get five, we'll take another millimeter off. If we get seven instead of six, We'll put a washer behind the four and one block, kick it out and fill the gap with cement. So we will restore that native joint line. So we're gonna measure, we have a nine millimeter thick implant. We cut the bone, there's no cartilage missing, but we lost a millimeter of bone because of the curve of the blade. So we want the distal lateral piece to be eight millimeters thick. 
plus the curve for the blade for nine to equal the implant thickness. On the medial side, we have two millimeters of cartilage missing, plus a millimeter of the curve for the blade is three, plus six is nine. So we now have set proximal distal varus valgus right back to the way the patient's knee was pre-arthritic. Now, what about posterior? Usually in a varus knee, you don't have substantial cartilage loss posterior medial unless the ACL has been deficient. In a valgus knee, it can happen. So we do have shims for the back of the posterior referencing guide, but this too initially is pinned to make sure that it sits. We put forces up along there and we pin it. Uh, and this, we check the cuts once again with a caliper. Again, the most important instrument in the operating room for total knee replacement is the caliper. They should be seven because the implant that we're using here is eight millimeters thick posterior. Seven plus a millimeter for the blade gives you eight. And here is the real benefit. This is the actual tourniquet time from incision to completing those cuts in this operation. Eight minutes. Oh. And I never put the x-rays up in the operating room. They're just not needed. So this is what the guy looks like at six weeks. We don't send anybody to physical therapy. That's his motion. And then if you want to look at the alignment, what you want to do when you do KA is a single leg view doesn't help you, whether it's just of the knee or the limb, because we're not looking for any particular number. We need to compare it to the opposite side. So if you're going to assess your radiographs postoperatively, which really doesn't help too much, if you really want to know how the knee does, measure the bone resections. That'll tell you. Because when you miss those, then you start to have problems, need MUAs and so forth. But you want to measure the distal femoral angle, proximity to tibial angle, and they should be within a couple of degrees of each side because there is some side-to-side -side variability. And that's how you do the operation. So if you look at the accuracy of the manual instruments with the guide system that I showed where we, we, we compress it to the joint surface, we need to define accuracy. Accurate technique is one that has no, a mean difference from the target of zero with no variability. In other words, the standard deviation is zero. So if we look at golf and putting, you would say that here we have pretty good precision. We have all, all three balls are essentially in the same spot, but we're inaccurate because we have a six inch mean difference from the target. Now here's a situation where our, our balls are a little short, six inches to the right and left. So the mean difference from the target is zero, but we have very little precision. We want all of them to be in the hole. So if you're going to examine a published study on accuracy, you want to be looking for the mean difference and the standard deviation value from the intended target. So this is a paper that we published looking at the accuracy with the manual instruments to resect the femur. It's comparable or better than the robot. And there's a negligible effect of surgeon experience because what are you doing? You're cutting a bone, you're measuring it with a caliper, that's what you do when you do the patella. So there's no special surgical skills other than rudimentary ones we should have learned and practiced as we've moved through our residency and fellowship and into practice. So if we look at the key ingredients, the distal medial, distal lateral, posterior medial, posterior lateral resections, and we look at the four less experienced surgeons in this particular study, which did 58 knees, the mean difference from target is 0.3 minus 0.4 standard deviation 0.5. Now compare that to the 10 more experienced surgeons, surgeons that did more than 50, there's no difference. And this is when we you didn't even do the correction yet. And the standard deviation is 0.5. Let's look at the Mako Robo. You have a really hard time finding this data in the literature. This paper was just published this year from Dr. Lee, single surgeon, not 10 experienced, but one surgeon. Their mean difference, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, is higher than our experienced surgeons, as is their standard deviations. And if you look at the Rosa Robot, it's the same problem. Why do they have inaccuracies with the robot? Because you got an image acquisition and 3D model generation. Often they're CT based. You don't know where the distal joint line is and you don't know where the cartilage is. And then you give a planning software to tilt and translate the component in six degrees of freedom. And when you click the button, change it a degree, change it a millimeter. That's gross, that's crude, that's inaccurate. We don't have any of that because our implants go right on the surface. And if you register them firmly with the pins, your cuts will be much more accurate than you'll ever get with a robot. And the only reason people use the robot is because they're doing in large part restricted kinematic alignment. They wanna know where the femoral head is. They wanna know where the ankle is. 
because they want to keep their cuts within a bound. But as I showed you, there's no really need to do that anymore because we have our New Zealand Australia study, we have our RSA study, we have longevity study that really the risk of this kind of a, a tibial component failure is much less than MA. So if you don't have to restrict, you don't need to know where the femoral head and ankle is, you don't need the technology. That's what it is. So this just shows these are statistically different. The accuracy is statistically better with the manual instruments, whether you're the, the less experienced or the experienced surgeon than using robotic technology. The fact that uh, I was talking about to establish that you've done the proper VV cut on the tibia. Once again, we've measured our distal femoral resections. We know they're right. And we think that we have the right varus valgus cut, but we're not sure. So we go back to the papers we've published. And by the way, other people have shown the same thing, that the knee, we call it the extension space composed of the medial and lateral gap. The medial lateral gap should be equal in the native knee. There's very little VV laxity. So when you put a spacer block in, if you look here, you can see that it's opening about a millimeter on the medial side right there. See it open? Mm -hmm. And that means we need to cut a millimeter off the lateral tibia to make it a rectangular gap. And this is what happens when you become better and better at this. So you won't accept the two millimeter thing. You'll, you'll, you'll take that blade and you'll feather down a millimeter. So let's look at it again. Watch it open right here medially. See, lateral side snug. We're looking, we're not, feel, we're not feeling it, we're looking at it. Look at it open a millimeter. So when you distract it a millimeter, you don't want that opening closing. And you say, okay, well, give me a 11 spacer block. We'll go from a 10 to 11, I'll close it down. You can, but you can't get it in because the lateral side's too tight. The lateral side's already snug with a 10. It's the medial side that's loose. The medial side looseness only comes from tibial cut error because you know the femoral cut is correct because you've measured the pieces and you know the ligaments are fine because they are in 99% of the people that you do. So it just teaches you to shave a little off and then you get a rectangular gap. Look at the checks, our verification checks that our insert uh, should be uh, correct is that the knee should fully extend easily. And we like even a little hyperextension most of the time. We don't want zero, three, four, five degrees of hyperextension you can do with K, you don't get midflexion instability. And once again, now we have the trials in, see, and we don't want to have any medial lateral laxity, but you got to be a little careful when you're using a sphere implant, uh, because not only does it give you the AP stability as if you have your anterior posterior cruciate ligament, it's also congruent in the sagittal plane. So it gives you a little more stability than maybe you would have if you flex the knee. So when you flex the knee, you want to have a little bit of opening on the lateral side, and you say, well, uh, that's, that's not what we do when we gap balance. Yeah, you're right. It isn't what we do when you gap balance. When you gap balance, you overconstrain the knee. And to prove it to yourself, just go scope a knee. You know, when you scope a knee, let's say you do four scopes. Let's say uh, the first two are uh, medial meniscus. You go in, oh, oh, geez, I can barely get my instruments in. Why? But, and you can't scope that knee in full extension. You got to flex it 15, 30 degrees to get your instruments in because the medial collateral ligaments resting length is a little slack when you flex it, that's normal. You need that. And you're going to have trouble with one knee and less over the other. Why? Because those two people have different laxities. Now you go to the lateral side, do a lateral menisectomy. You say, oh my goodness, boy, a little, this one's a little tough. And then the next one, you can drive a truck through the lateral compartment. Why? Because their laxities are different. That's why I don't believe you can use ligament tensioning to set the component positions. So once again, that's a, a violation of your tightening the knee in the flex space so it can't rotate, it won't feel natural to the patient. And that once again, gets you away from the robot or the nav that enables you to measure ligament laxities. You get it by default when you do KA, you restore the native laxities by default when you resurface the knee. Mm -hmm. It happens naturally. And that's why we, we can restore native forces when you do KA and you'll never get it with MA restricted or functional alignment because you're going to jam the flexion space with those techniques. So it really is, I mean, when you just step back and look at all the evidence trying to get people to look at the knee from a total hip perspective or a total shoulder perspective of trying to just restore the anatomy, we've got to go through all these gyrations to unload or unlearn what we've had for 20 or 30 years in our head looking at the knee from a mechanical alignment surgeon's viewpoint. And, and so that's the evidence that we're trying to bring to you today is 
there's a lot of stuff out there. And if you free your mind up and you put on the, the, the looking glass, let me, let me bring that up to you because it really is an illustrative thing to read uh, the looking glass. Let's see, looking, uh -huh. it's this one from Arthroplasty Today. It says, use the right looking glass when you do caliper verified kinematically aligned TKA. And if you read it, it it's that when you, you look at the looking glass was a Lewis Carroll uh, sequel to Alice in Wonderland. And what happens is that, that she goes through uh, this mirror and the world flips on the other side and everything looks different to her. And that's really what happens when you do uh, MA and you start to do KA. You have to be careful not to keep the, the view of your knee from an MA perspective, because you're going to cut the tibia and you're going to look at the ankle and you're going to say, oh, I can't do that. So if you were to visit me in the OR and we're doing a total knee replacement and you, I look at your eyes, and, oh, he's going to cut in too much virus. You know what I do? I take a towel and I lay it over the ankle so you can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want you to see it because it it constricts you. You say, oh, that's going to be five degrees. I, I can only go four. But once again, we're not looking at it with the ankle. We're just trying to resurface the knee. And we do it when we go back to these steps here. And, uh, and we see that we have the, you know, the trapezoidal gap inflection or trapezoidal space with a more lax lateral uh, gap than medial. But both are more lax than it is in full extension. You have to preserve that, we think, to get the forgotten joint score that you want. Yes, yeah, so this concept that uh, kinematic alignment's a virus cut in the tibia, it could not be, how should we say, further from the truth. Mm -hmm. We restore the patient's periarthritic joint lines. So by definition, we don't put any joint line in varus or valgus with respect to the mechanical axis. Well, let me rephrase that. From If you look at knee replacement from a mechanical alignment surgeon's point of view, we're looking at we're changing all this stuff. From a kinematic alignment point of view, I'm going to show you that when you do mechanical alignment, you change the femoral joint line and tibial joint lines in nearly everybody. And it's that change in the joint lines that causes the problem. And the biggest problem is on the femoral side. So when you look at varus tibial component failure, which is what everybody's worried about, it's caused by mechanical alignment, restricted alignment, because they're changing the joint lines. And if we look at Michael Hirschman's work, phenotyping the knee in young non-osteoarthritic knee shows a wide distribution of femoral and tibial coronal alignment. So if we look at this schematic from their study, what you'll find is that the neutral alignment of the femur is actually three degrees of valgus. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the proportions, 85% of patients that you do mechanical alignment on, you will cut the, put the femoral component in varus to the patient's periarthritic joint line. And that's the fundamental step that leads to varus tibial component loosening, as I'll show you in a moment, or varus overload. You're putting the femur in varus nearly every case when you do MA, but kinematic alignment sets no femoral components in varus because we restored the native joint line. Now let's go to the tibial side. So this is the same paper, but we'll look at the schematic from the tibial side. And this is where you got your point, uh, Dr. Sangavi, where you said, oh yeah, three degrees, 87 degrees. Well, certainly when you look at a variety of normal patients, the tibial inclination is three degrees varus. But if you look at the other knees, when you do mechanical alignment, you're only setting 70% of the tibias in valgus to the native joint line, where you've set 85% of your femurs in varus to the femoral joint line, which means 15% of the time you've left the limb in varus, and that leads to overload. So when I look at a knee, I want to see that I've restored the native joint line. So I don't look at it as a varus valgus deviation. I look at it, did I hit my target? And my target is the patient's pre-arthritic joint line. We'll talk about how to do that in a moment. So here's a case of my own. Uh, and it was really a sort of an eye-opening one. The lady just lives around the corner from me. So I, very nice gal. I did kinematic alignment in June of 2007. She still walks around the neighborhood. It's been whatever that is, 16 years or 15 years. And I placed the femoral component to restore the patient's periarthritic joint line, which was seven degrees valgus. And now six months earlier, before I started doing kinematic alignment in everybody, I placed that femoral component in zero. I put it in varus to the native joint line and look at the osteolysis. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, that's, and you can see the distraction on this side when she stands versus this side. So she's had a high adduction moment, been loading that medial side, and we went, had to go back in and revise that tibia. But the KA knee survives because, as we'll talk about later, it restores a balanced knee. By definition, it restores the patient's uh, prearthritic medial lateral tibial compartment forces, which cannot be done with mechanical alignment, restricted or functional alignment. Thank you. So that was a very concise explanation about how we're attempting to restore the native prearthritic alignment of the knee. And the X-rays will obviously look a bit different than the mechanically aligned knees. So it does appear different for a mechanically aligned surgeon to look at an X-ray from a kinematically aligned surgeon. And this raises one of the concerns amongst the mechanically aligned surgeons because of conventional teaching and training perhaps is that does putting the tibia in varus compromise implant survivorship or lead to early polywear? And what is the outer limit for the degree of varus that you would implant your tibia in? Perfect. I've got some slides for you. Those are good questions. So I think perspectively, it's very hard if you're, the rules are different for MA than KA. If you look at a KA knee from an MA viewpoint, you're going to be confused. Absolutely. Just like if I, when I look at an MA knee on x-ray, I say, oh, geez, the femoral component's in virus, the tibia component is in valgus. They're all liable to not like their knee. That's how I look at the x-ray. When you or an MA person looks at my, oh, my goodness, they put the tibia in virus. These are going to fail and everything else. So you have to get a different hat on. You have to have a different perspective. So let's look at what evidence there is that you're going to have high tibial uh, component uh, uh, failure with KA. And so in a short answer to your question, how much varus do we put the tibial component in? Once again, we don't put the tibial component in varus. Mm. We restore the patient's prearthritic joint line. So relative to that target, we don't put implants in varus or valgus. How far will we go? It doesn't matter because we're resurfacing the patient's knee. And I'll show you some evidence that that does not have a problem in just a moment. So let's look at some data other than my own. This is from uh, the New Zealand and Australian registries. Similar risk of revision uh, for a kinematic aligned TKA as it composed to other uh, implants put in using mechanical alignment. So these were all done with the Otis knee, Otis Med uh, uh, PSI, which I developed in 2006 or seven. We released it in New Zealand, Australia, and uh, Antonio Clayson went back and looked at all the knees that were done. They were recorded with that technique and compared it to all the other knees uh, with a triathlon knee. They were all done with MA and the failure rate was the same. So there was no increased failure, at least at seven years with this technique. If you look at my own implant survival data, it's a case series of 207, 20 knees that we did in 2007 with 10 year follow-up. That was our aseptic revision rate, very, very low. If we compare that to Bonner, similar case series with MA, there's 93 or four. And if you look at Perrette and backdate it to 10 years instead of 15, it's also 93. So we certainly don't have a higher failure rate, at least according to the New Zealand, Australia registry data and my own. Now, why is that? And we'll talk about it a little bit more. It's because we actually restore native medial and lateral compartment forces, which is the key. We're not overloaded medial. And we're gonna show you some examples of really high loads medially caused by mechanical alignment and mitigated by KA. But this is a study that we are ongoing. We have now finished one year data and there's time after surgery on the x-axis. And this is mean maximum total point motion with RSA. So RSA, you can look at that as another word as being uh, uh, subsidence. And if you look at the 35 knees we've done, we measured them on the day of surgery, the position of the tibia with respect to coordinate system or the position of the base plate with respect to the coordinate system in the tibia. And we looked at it six weeks, three months, six months, it doesn't move. Mm -hmm. And if the mean value is less than 0.5 at six months, the risk of going on a fail as a group is negligible. And our measurement error is two tenths of a millimeter. So when you look at it, it's a tenth of a millimeter with KA. Mm -hmm. Now you asked me about the so-called varus alignment or varus cut on the tibia. So this is the proximal tibial angle. We have long legs. We measured this on everybody. And here's the proximal tibial angle. So if you're an MA person, you're trying to stick it here. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the maximum total point motion here in the scatter plot, you can see that 
in our study, if you were doing mechanical alignment, you say, oh my goodness, Dr. Hal, you put 90% of your tibias in varus to the mechanical alignment criteria, but look at the slope. There's no increased risk of migration as you go into more and more varus on the tibia because we don't put the tibial component in varus for restoring the native joint surface. So RSA is a very, very well-respected, time-honored technique. It's quantitative. I mean, it's a quantitative to an accuracy of 0.2 millimeters, and it's not moving. So if it doesn't move in the first six months to a year, by the data that's out there in the literature, it's not going to move at all. And that goes along with what we've seen. Our problems with tibial component failure are in the sagittal plane. Sagittal plane. And it, and it happens... It happens when we, it happens when we cut the tibial component in too much slope with respect to the native joint line. So if we're five degrees more slope, the flexion space gets loose, the tibia spends more time anterior with respect to the femoral condyles and it loads the posterior edge of the tibia and either it'll subside in the first, in the first uh, four to five years or the polyethylene will wear on the posterior rim and it'll spin out. So if you match the slope and retain the PCL, tibial component failure is relatively negligible from implant subsidence. Uh, you can still get poly wear and we can talk about that a little later, but that happens with MA as well. So I think you can take it to the bank that if you want to get rid of varus tibial loosening, then stop doing MA, stop doing restricted kinematic alignment, and just do unrestricted caliper verified KA, and that problem will resolve itself. So that sets right the concept of kinematic alignment and its rationale to us. But now there are two more terms which add some more confusion to the mind, which we would need you to simplify, simplify for us or just explain in short. What is the meaning of restricted kinematic alignment and inverse kinematic alignment? Well, Restricted kinematic alignment um, is based on this premise, and, and I, I don't have trouble with the concept mm -hmm. is that some people are afraid to go all the way to do unrestricted K because of this concern of loosening. So when restricted K was developed, which was back about 10 years ago, uh, it, was, it was with that sort of a foundation of thinking. But now that we're 10 years later and we're not seeing this varus loosening, then all of a sudden the restrictions can, if you will, come off. There's no need for the restrictions. And so I think that's, that's a fun inverse kinematic. I have no idea what it is. It's cut the tibia and do something on the femoral side. Neither of those techniques adhere to the principle of kinematic alignment, which is to set the component, the femoral components, rotational axes coincident with that of the native knee. So when you're looking at, at KA, that's what we do. When you're looking at restricted KA or inverse kinematic alignment. My term for both of these would to be to take the word kinematic alignment out of them because they're not doing anything kinematically related mm -hmm. and call them expanded mechanical alignment. That's what they are. They've taken mechanical criteria and expanded it to go beyond what they would normally do. And frankly, I think that's really a problem that could lead to increased issues with component failure and so forth because they're not truly restoring the kinematics of the knee when they do those techniques. Okay, so there you go, calling a spade a spade. So you believe only in kinematic alignment and nothing at all to do with restricted or inverse kinematic alignment. Is yeah, I think that uh, it, it's not so much what I believe in, it's just that's the, that's the biologic facts. Yeah. Let's, let's go to total hip. I mm -hmm. mean, when you do total hip, what do you try to do? You were trying to restore the hip center, Application. the yeah. offset and the version. Absolutely. And now if you're a knee surgeon doing restricted or whatever, inverse kinematic alignment, you say, well, I don't, I don't want to use that lateral opening. I don't want to use that version. I'm going to change the offset. I'm going to change the limb length. You wouldn't do that. Just, just do what you do with whether it's fracture care, restoring the joint surface, your hip replacement, shoulder replacement. Every operation we do in the body is to restore the kinematic behavior of the joint with the only exception being total knee replacement. It's the only one. So I, I think that makes so much sense because, I mean, you know, when we do total hips, what we do is we template the opposite side and we're trying to reproduce that in our surgery. But for knees, we're not doing that with the mechanically aligned ones, at least. 
and we're just going in with a completely different set of angles and belief rather than trying to restore what was there before or what's there on the opposite side if that's not arthritic so that does make a lot of sense now what we're trying to do with kinematic alignment and i think um you know to further that point i, I might have been a little remiss when you look at the kinematic axes that are all related to the femoral articular surface mm -hmm. they have no relationship to the femoral head or ankle mm -hmm. I, I mean when you're when you if you're trying to align a knee looking at the femoral head and ankle you might as well look at their ear their big toe their tongue their tooth i mean if you're a dentist and I always ask this in an audience, most of the people that are a little older, they've had a crown on a tooth. And when the dentist, you know, puts a crown and I ask him, have you had a crown? Yes, I have. Okay, which tooth? I go, oh, it's one of these. I said, you don't know, do you? No, because you have a forgotten tooth. We want a forgotten joint score in the knee, like we have on the hip. Yes. But yes. when the dentist goes in to put the tooth in, he's not looking to see where the chin is or the nose or this tooth over here. He's just looking in that area where yeah. that tooth is worn out and he's trying to fabricate that tooth to fit the surface of the old one. That's what kinematic alignment is. When you get it, you don't even put an x-ray up in the operating room. Mm -hmm. I, I, now look at an x-ray pre-op if I've got hardware in there or some terrible bone loss from a prior infection or something. But, you know, 99.8% of the knees I do every year, you don't need an x-ray. In fact, I have the operation planned when I look at the person standing up in the office. And if I'm off, I just look at the joint surfaces. I'll explain in a moment. Wow. Okay, so that clears all the confusion surrounding the entire spectrum of kinematic alignment. But another bone of contention for the mechanical aligned surgeons is that they feel kinematic alignment can only be used for mild cases of arthritis. And they have the doubts about being able to utilize kinematic alignment for severe varus or valgus deformities, especially with bone loss, which is rather common in this part of the world. So my question to you is, can kinematic alignment be used effectively for such severe deformities with bone loss? And if yes, how does the technique vary in these cases? So I'm going to share with you a case that sort of illustrates that, to be honest with you, the most severe deformities are easier to do with K than MA. And when you try to do them with MA, you're not getting MA anyway, and you're putting the knee in with imbalance. So let me show you a case of an achondroplastic dwarf. And this was uh, uh, shared with me from uh, Moisa, Moisares uh, from Geneva. And he had this person had an achondroplastic dwarf with varus deformity. And he tried to do mechanical alignment on this knee. And of course, he leaves it in varus, and the femoral component is placed in varus relative to the native joint line. And he left the knee unbalanced. If you look at this in the standing position, he's got a closed space medial and distraction laterally. So he's got a very high adduction moment. As I'll show in a moment, mechanical alignment increases the adduction moment. Kinematic alignment restores it to native and is less than MA every time. So the adduction moment works to our favor when we do KA and against the MA. So now, We've got, what are we going to do when he shows up with the other side? He needs that one done. Hmm? Nice virus deformity. If you look at the mechanically aligned TKA, the red arrow is the moment arm to the center of the knee, and that is the adduction moment. So it's the force here with that angle. And if you look at the native knee, the native knee here, even though it's in varus, has a shorter moment arm, adduction moment arm than the other side. So if we do kinematic alignment and we open the medial side and correct it, we're going to move the knee closer to the midline and reduce the adduction moment, and we will have a balanced knee. So this is the same person with a KA on the other side. Oh. And if you look at the adduction moment now, it's even lower now that the kinematic alignment has corrected the prearthritic varus deformity. Which knee is going to fail? It's not going to be the KA one. It's going to be the MA one. So I have enough experience now. I've done K exclusively since 2007. I started with it in 2006 and could only do one a week due to we had to manufacture PS, uh, PS guides, but or, uh, uh, patient specific guides. But once we could do a full time, I, I, I've done it on everybody. And that's 6,500 knees spanning 15 years. 
I mean, this idea that, oh, they only last 10 years, baloney, I tell them, you put the thing in, it'll last your lifetime if you're 60. Just go use it, enjoy yourself. You're not going to wear it out typically. So if you think that this is just one case, then let's go to Dr. Nikki's excellent work, who's a very um, devoted KA surgeon in Tokyo. And he has the same sort of problem, I think, that you do with this more of a genetic bow in their patient population. And he showed that kinematically aligned TKA actually um, reduces the knee adduction moment more than mechanically aligned TKA. And uh, this, this is uh, his paper from KSSTA. And here he shows the ground reaction force uh, from the center of mass in yellow going to the center of the ankle. And he draws in the mechanically aligned TKA this adduction moment. And if you do KA, what happens is the ankle, instead of being a wide base position, moves closer to under the center of mass and the adduction moment is less. So his conclusion was that KA is a promising option in 2017. Now it is the option in my view for patients with large coronal bone of the tibia because the adduction moment lowers the risk of varus loosening. And he was kind enough to send me these videos. Now, this person obviously to the left did not have kinematically aligned told me arthroplasties. But when you watch her walk, one foot goes in front of the other. And that's what happens when you do KA, the ankles move under the center of the mass, which narrows the adduction moment. Now, the gentleman to the right has had bilateral MATKA, and they've got a widened gait. And so their adduction moment is higher. Of course, it's not a normal gait anyway. So once again, KA wins out when you work with the worst deformities you have, they're the easiest to do with KA. And when you strive to get mechanical alignment, you won't get it anyway. And you're gonna have to use a lot of over, you know, extra constraint in the implants to try to make the X-ray look pretty. And these are all problems that you're causing as a surgeon by unfortunately changing the patient's pre-arthritic joint lines. You leave them alone and all the constrained implants go in the closet and you don't have to get them out. But what do you do when, in the cases where there is, um, like for example, there's medial tibial bone loss or even there's lateral tibial bone loss in rheumatoid knees. So how do you restore the, um, how do you resurface the thickness of that uh, component? All right. So let me go back uh, if I can share my screen again. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a case that is sort of a fun one. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a person uh, we'll go over these issues. So in principle, on the femur, 99.999% of femurs that you'll do will not have bone loss at full extension or zero degrees and 90. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, we have these terrible deformities. I said, yeah, so do we. But when you have a bad deformity, then he doesn't extend. They walk with a 20 degree flexion contracture. Mm -hmm. There's no way for that bone to wear distally on the convexity in extension. And why would it wear 90 degrees when you're not doing anything? You're just sitting on a chair or whatever. So you can take it to the bank, and I'll show you the paper that we have for that, that there's negligible bone wear in the most severe deformed knees at zero and 90, where we reference with our guides to do the surgery. So here's a patient. You'd say that one's a pretty good one, huh? That's a very simple primary told me replacement. There's the x-ray. It's all subluxed and you think the MCL has gone, the lateral collateral ligament's gone. When you do KA, you'll find that when you think ligaments are stretched, they're really not. And if you find you have to release a ligament when you're doing kinematic alignment, then go back, as we'll show you in a moment, measure your bone resections because you'll find that you didn't restore the patient's joint lines. Whenever you're cutting ligaments, the implants are in crooked. So this is what the knee looks like when you open it up. So you can see that the notch is all stenotic, it's been chronic ACL deficient, huge osteophytes, but the bone here at the zero position really hasn't contacted the tibia for probably 10 years because the guy's been walking on this flexion contraction. And so there's really no bone wear at zero. And this is a study that we did uh, with Dennis Nam and uh, Robert Barrick, where they looked at a bunch of MRIs that I had and tried to see if the bone wear and cartilage wear was predictable at zero and 90, where we referenced the femur with our guides. And so we simply, this is a, a valgus knee. Uh, we drew an anatomic sagittal line. And from that, we constructed a best fit circle. And then we were able to measure uh, the deviation of the bone from that circle and see if there was bone wear. 
And uh, we did the same on the medial side. And so this is why when we do look at the knee in the proper sagittal plane, where the MRI sagittal plane is perpendicular to the axis in the femur or perpendicular to a line coincident to the posterior and distal joint lines, that the cir circumference of that circle medially and laterally is the same. Mm -hmm. So a valgus knee does not have hypoplasia of the lateral femoral condyle. It's just translated relative to the medial. So we showed there's no bone wear. And you can read this paper if you'd like. Just one question there, like in the subluxed knee that you showed right now, yep. even those cases, you'd never really need to release any, perform any releases, which mechanically aligned surgeons would be going extensively and performing a release. Is that correct? Yes, and I'm going to tell you something. Um, it is a learning process. Mm -hmm. When I started doing it in 2006, we were making the PSI guide. We only had the ability to make one a week. So I would do three or four total knees. And sometimes the guide wouldn't show up because we had to have it shipped in and blah, blah. And so it might be the third case or whatever. And the first case I do, and I say, you know, it went good. And I didn't do any releases with MA. And then the next one, oh, you know, the meocollateral ligaments are tight. Well, what, why is that? And then I do the PSI. And, and when you did, did it initially with K, you had to ask yourself the question, you know, am I doing something that could be harmful? You know, I mean, that, that's in the back of your mind. You know, I'm not lying. To, am I doing something that's harmful? So what I would do is I would put the IM rod up. I'd select an angle five. And then I would put the distal femoral guide on and I'd put the saw blade in and I just cut the bone a millimeter, just enough to see where the line was. And then I put my PSI guide on. I do the same thing. I take it off and geez, what's the difference? Two degrees. It wasn't much. And you'd found that as you did these more and more severe deformities over time, because I started with the easy stuff, you realize you're not cutting ligaments. And then you realize the only reason you were cutting ligaments is because you're putting the parts in crooked in the native joint line. So once you stop doing that, all of a sudden the need for, you know, uh, more constrained implants, or revision implants subsided. So your, your valgus deformities are very easy to treat uh, and you don't have to do a lot of extra, uh, um, you know, hardware. You just use primary knee components. So it's really pretty easy. Principles are simple. Just restore the surface. And by the way, we didn't talk about the tibia, but we, we, we should. When you do the femur, and that's why the femur is done first, it has to be femur first, you've restored the native joint line. And then how do you know you have the VV right? Well, you set it so that you try to cut an even amount off medial lateral, but we always look at the tibia cut as provisional, mm -hmm. an educated provisional cut. We want it conservative enough that we get maybe a 10 spacer block end because that's our thinnest insert. And when we go in full extension, we'll take a look at the surface between the distal femoral cut, the spacer block and the tibia, and we'll do a VV maneuver. And if the lateral side opens, say, two millimeters and the medial side's good, then if we want to restore the native tibial joint line, we're going to have to cut another two millimeters off the medial side because that will give us a tight rectangular gap, which everybody has. The knee is a, is a, is a rigid body and extension. Everybody's knees that way once you get rid of the osteophytes and the ligaments are good. So by definition, if your distal femoral cuts are correct and you've restored the joint line and your spacer block gives you a rectangular space and so does eventually your trial components as a second check, then you've restored the limb alignment back to the patient's pre-arthritic, no matter how much tibial bone is missing. Yeah. So it, it is resurfacing in the true sense of the word. That's what it is. Saying. It is. So when you look at balancing the KA knee, uh, for us, it's really simple because the base plate I use is anatomically shaped and it's designed to set so that when it's best fit to the margins of the tibial resection, automatically sets ML, AP, and IE so then how do we balance knee? There's only three things. Get the VV tibia cut right. Restore the native slope, which we do that. Maybe I get my phone. Let's say this is the tibial cut. Then I'm going to look at the medial side and I'm going to look and see, did my, is, if this is a joint surface, is that pretty parallel to my cut? And if you see that anteriorly, it's uh, three millimeters thicker, then you know you didn't do enough slope. And of course, uh, vice versa, if you did it with too much slope. And obviously there's a little objectivity to it, subjectivity to it, uh, but we have some other checks with the spacer block and stuff that helps you recognize whether that, that the slope is correct. But if you're within a couple degrees, it's fine. So it's adjust the VV, replace, uh, restore the slope, and then it's adjust the insert thickness. That's what makes kinematic alignment so quick to do 
because the thought process is the same every time. Do the distal cut, measure it, make sure it's correct. On the femur, do your posterior cut, measure it, make sure it's correct. Now you're set, just got to play with the tibia. Ligament release, out the door. Go back and recut the femur in some direction or other, out the door. It's only those three steps. So when I'm done a busy day, I'm physically tired. But mentally, not tired at all. Oh, geez. Oh, geez. how did I get into trouble with that knee? I ended up getting a more constrained implant. You know, shouldn't maybe I shouldn't have cut that MCL. That's the kind of stuff that goes through my head back in 2006 when I could only do one KA knee a day. Those things go away. It's fun. Okay. So now moving on to the unsolved mystery surrounding total knee arthroplasty is what I believe is patient dissatisfaction following total knee arthroplasty. And it's about 20% in total knees, which is unlike the hip where a forgotten joint is more easily attainable. And this has become even more important since the US healthcare system is now moving to a value-based system rather than a volume-based system. And I suspect this will also impact and be the norm in many countries worldwide today or tomorrow. So why do you think dissatisfaction rates are higher with mechanically aligned knees and is kinematically aligned total knee arthroplasty the true answer to this question? And also, how has your personal experience on this topic been before 2005, 2006, when you were doing mechanically aligned knees? And after that, when you've been doing kinematically aligned knees? Well, let me, let me answer the last question first. I have a few slides to answer the first two, but they ask, how has my experience changed? I mean, here's what happens. Your office is empty. I mean, it's just plain empty. These people aren't coming back at three, six months complaining of a hemoarthrosis, complaining of, oh, my knee. Are all of our knees perfect? Absolutely not. But when we have a problem knee, it's sort of like a good MA knee. Because people still complain. You can't make everybody happy. But these, these things that you scratch your head, uh, I mean, when someone comes back in, it's usually, oh, I was walking my dog and I fell four weeks ago and I hit my knee and I'm worried I did something. You look at the x-rays, you tell them you didn't break anything. You tell them the knee isn't fragile. They smile, they leave. Mm -hmm. Someone comes in, I, oh, here's a follow-up. I wonder if the tibial component is loose. I don't even think of it. It's just, it's just so rare that it happens. So it changes your office hours. All of a sudden, you can spend your time in the operating room. And the other thing that happens, like, to, what's today? It's today, Thursday. Yep. <laughs> Tomorrow's Friday. So my PA sees the six-week follow-ups now because I get Friday off. I'm getting a little older. I get a nice day off. So she's going to see eight of my total knees that I did about six weeks ago. I usually do 10 a week, five on Monday, five on Wednesday. I'm usually done by 2 o'clock. takes me an, an hour and knee. Uh, and you go home. But these eight will come in. And she said to me, well, doctor, I think three, we can we'll probably be able to sign up one or two of them the other side. So that's what happens. Your turnaround to get the other knee is shorter and people are willing to make the turn. So you don't see them back in one year. Why do you do that? Mm -hmm. You see people back in one year because we sort of want to make sure that we don't miss doing the opposite knee. You don't really need to see them. If things are falling apart, they're going to let you know. This idea of seeing people back every year sends a bad message. It tells them that their knee's fragile. It tells them they should constantly be worried about it. I mean, the dentist doesn't bring me back every year to look at the crown on the tooth. I go eat what I want. I don't think about it. That's how the knee should be. There's too much negativism in total knee replacement. So with K8, it changes your whole office hours, opens it up for more new patient patients, depletes the patients coming in with all the big issues because you don't see them, the instability, the stiffness. Uh, MUA, very small instance, one or 2%. But matter of fact, we did a gal last, last uh, three or four weeks ago, an MUA a year out after we did her total knee. She came in, it was a little stiff. She was a little chubby in the back. You can do an MUA a year out, you still get the motion back because the parts are in right. With MA, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a problem. So maybe I share my, my screen for a moment again, yep, sure. and I put together a couple of, a couple of uh, slides because you asked me about, you know, what's going on in the general, how should we say world community? And, and actually KA has been, and I think you're going to ask me this, why, why has it been slow in the U S and, and that'll be our other question, but we'll get to that around the world. You know, there's 11 of 13 randomized trials, case controlled trials and case series 
of a K in one knee and MA in the other knee. And all of them report in some level that K is better than MA. There is not a single one that shows MA is better than anything. Nothing. There's not a paper showing MA is better than KA. It started in 2014. And look at the location and the timeline. First one, the randomized trial was done at US by Dawson. That was the old Otis knee, K versus MA, much higher Oxford score, knee society score, flexion, better walking, blah, blah, blah. Now we go to Germany in 2017. Once again, it's uh, the Otis knee, better outcomes. They had a couple bad outcomes with KA because the guides didn't always fit, but that's explainable and treatable and the risk can be reduced now by manual instrumentation. Then it goes to Japan by Matsumoto. It goes back to, it goes to Australia in 19, back to Australia in 20, back to Japan by Nikki in 20, then to Australia. But look where this is taking place. It's not taking place in the US. Germany, then it goes to the US, back to us, Israel. And finally, after eight years, it comes back to the USA, the study that was just done at the, at the Arthroplasty uh, AUKUS meeting in Dallas was, uh, uh, Vidorchek, John Vidorchek compared his MA to his KA and the forgotten joint scores were much, much higher with KA than MA. So now at least at special surgery, and we'll talk about in a moment why the, why the US uh, thought leaders have been relatively thoughtless on this topic. Um, the cat's out of the bag in the US now. They can't ignore it. And so I believe that since special surgery now has to deal with it, we now have global validation of KA. We have Australia, we have the Middle East, we have uh, Asia, uh, we have uh, uh, US. So it's not something that is not going to go away. To me, it's going to be the standard of care. And in a few years, you're gonna have a hard time justifying doing MA. And I think this is the tip of the iceberg. But I also think we may see less and less of these randomized trials because it becomes, it's hard to have an equal position that, oh, Mary, I think we have MA and K, we don't know which one works better. And that's a little disingenuous. And, and you needed that when you look back at Dossett's study and some of these others, we really didn't know. But now I think KA has got enough of a footing, it's gonna to be tough to do it. So what about the implant? You know, I, um, I used to think that the implant really didn't make much of a difference. And that was because I generally use the same types. You know, my initial experience, Vanguard CR, low-conforming medial lateral. And then I went to Stryker CR, low-conforming medial lateral. And I went to Depuy Sigma, low-conforming medial lateral. Persona, low-conforming medial lateral. They were all the same. So KA made those implants work better than MA did. But is that the best design? So if you look at the medial, I call it the ball and socket because you really need a socket. Medial pivot, some of them are a little sloppier. They're more of an ultra congruent, but regardless, K results are best when you use a medial ball and socket as the forgotten joint scores are as good as total hip, if not better. If your knee results are not as good as your total hip, please take a good look at caliper verified KA. This is Dave Scott's paper published this year in Arthroplasty. Outcomes are better with a medial stabilized versus a posterior stabilized implant. So we're going against where half the knees are put in with PS when they're done with KA. At two years, the forgotten joint score was 10 points higher on a 100 point scale and flexion eight degrees better when you did KA with the medial ball and socket or sphere implant uh, than you did with a posterior stabilized. Now let's go to... Uh, back to um, Australia, which French was the senior author, or uh, uh, Roger Brighton is a senior author, a single surgeon series comparing, you know, KA, uh, the cruciate retaining and medial stabilized implants using KA principles. At one year, the forgotten joint score was 16 points higher with the medial ball and socket stability than the CR instability. Why is that? Those implants are sloppy. They needed to be sloppy when they were designed because the implantation process with MA is sloppy. Mm -hmm. If you have a patient with bilateral varus deformity and you do MA a year apart, I will guarantee you that those femoral resections do not match on the either side of the knee because you'll put your rod up or you'll put your robot in, you'll, you'll go and you'll do something or another and you, oh, I'm doing the trans epi axis, you can't find it anyway, the white side's lined. You're not gonna have four bone resections the same, but if that patient lived in India and uh, Dr. Simvaniak, you did the one knee and he moves to the US 
and I do KA and you do KA and I call you up and I said, hey, hey, uh, I did your patient's other knee. Uh, can you go back in your records? Let me know what your cuts were on the femur. Hey, I did kinematic alignment. That distal medial cut was six. The distal lateral cut was eight. The posterior cuts were seven. I said, those were mine. Those are my cuts. Now we can put an implant in whose conformity or congruency on the medial side is ball and socket like the native knee that Freeman described in 2005. We can have a flat lateral insert which promotes internal external rotation, which is necessary for the patella to translate medial and lateral as the knee is flexed because we know that when the knee flexes, it obligatorily internally rotates. That's driven by the socket medial and the increasing tension in the PCL. And while that happens, the Q angle decreases, which is needed for the patella to be in the proper medial lateral position. So that I think is one of the reasons we see these people come in and you say, uh, Mary, what are you here for? Well, doctor, you know, my knee is stiff. Uh-huh. Um, what can you do? Well, I can walk a mile or two, but I'm telling you, sit in a chair, go to give it stiff. I said, well, Mary, well, why don't you bend your good knee? And they bend a the good knee all the way. And you say, okay, why don't you bend your total knee? It bends all the way. And you look at them and you say, how can you be so ungrateful? You're walking a mile, you got a knee that bends just like that, and you're telling me it's stiff. Could it be that the tibia is not internally rotating right? Because there's a posterior lateral lip on the insert. And when that posterior lateral lip of the insert engages at about 30, 40 degrees, the tibia cannot internally rotate anymore by a medial pivot. It continues to internally rotate, but by the medial femoral condyle translating anteriorly with paradoxical movement. And it's driven by a low conforming surface, medial and lateral. So if you look at KA with a medial ball and socket, you now have an athletic like knee replacement. It changes the whole paradigm of who you're gonna work on. You don't have to wait till they come crawling in your office. You start do some of these people and get them back to a little higher quality life. And you'll have a better chance doing that with a medial stabilized than you do with a PS and a CR insert. So alignment is important. Doing KA opens other possibilities, opens the use of a more physiologic or native morphology implant to give a more natural movement and function. And to me, I think when you look at the forgotten joint scores and the Oxford knee scores with KA, especially with medial stabilized, they're higher than a uni. Because you have anterior stability when you have a medial ball and socket on the medial side. When you do a uni, you have a medial menisectomized medial compartment. Hmm? Because you're less conforming medially than the normal knee. But KA enables this and you, you don't have the risk of creating the stiffness because you've measured the femoral resections with your caliper, which sets up a wonderful physiology for that knee and an easy recovery. So your you know, patients don't have to go to therapy and they get their motion back more quickly and they're driving their car quickly and they're less burdensome to their families. And they start sending your friend, their friends and relatives to you and you get so busy, you don't know what to do with. So lastly, before we end this discussion, why do you think despite the overwhelming evidence that kinematic alignment has not caught on as widely as it should have or what are the concerns or apprehensions that surgeons still have in adopting kinematic alignment? Is it to do with training or lack of belief or not wanting to come out of their comfort zone? What really do you feel is the hindrance? Well, I have a, I have a couple of slides for you. Can I put those on? Of course, of course. So, you know, the question is why has KA maybe been adopted more so internationally rather than in the United States? And, you know, what, when you look at the, global um, uh, list of publications I shared with you, where did they come from? They didn't come from the US. They came from everywhere else. Why did that happen? Because I could not get an implant company to look at this seriously. And all the major ones for the most part are in the US. So back in 2009, when our PSI guides got taken off the market by the FDA because they were not equivalent to MA, and they were worried about the problem with it long longevity. So we could no longer do it with PSI. So I developed the manual technique with the, you know, pinning the guides to the femur and everything like I showed you. And uh, Norm Scott asked me to write a chapter on the PSI guides for his book, uh, Insole book. And so 
at that point, I thought, we can't do the PSI. So I switched to manual. I wrote the chapter and then I made videos. I put them up on ViewMedi. 2017, the FDA gave approval to the technique. After all these people said it wouldn't work. And the biggest critique came from my training hospital, Rothman Institute, when there was a paper published uh, out of there by Bill Hozak, who did the first four PSI guides with striker knee back in 2006, never got a post-op x-ray, never got clinical results, looked at the cuts with respect to navigation in the day and said, everything's gonna fail. That's why we lost. So it's taken a long time, but I'm very grateful that you know now we're here. So the knee society members in the US are innerly related with the implant companies and they ignored kinematic alignment because it came from me. I'm not fellowship trained in orthoplasty. I'm not even fellowship trained in anything. I'm a ligament guy. The advantage of that is my perspective is different than a mechanical alignment surgeon. If I had done a mechanical alignment fellowship, I might not have done this because I too would have had difficulty looking at the knee a different way. And the reason I could do it was because I'm indebted to Professor Hall at the biomedical engineering department, UC Davis. He and I have done you know, hundreds of papers now on kinematics of the knee, both in the arthroplasty and the native knee. And we knew that there were these axes. We knew it because our machinery that we tested knees in had them. So they were all ignored by the implant companies. So the knee society members in the implant companies, this is how they were for all these years. They had their head in the sand. They didn't want to address it. And the reason I didn't want to address it is because it's difficult to get a man or a company to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. And that's, that's really the background, I think, for why it's been so hard in the US. Internationally, it's not been so hard because the surgeons aren't dealing with the implant companies so, so tightly as we are in the US. So the message isn't so much so tightly controlled. And I think it's been a little hard in the academic centers because you needed a person in each academic center who wasn't being bullied by one of these knee society guys telling them you're gonna go, you're gonna fail, you're gonna rah, rah, rah. and that's what goes on. You have to have someone say, well, wait a minute, let's look at it a little differently. So it's a very, very exciting time, I think. And I don't have any bitterness with this for this. I just wanna make sure that you don't think I'm that way because I'm not. It's actually a double blessing because when the criticism has been laid the way it's been laid with this, it's forced everyone to do good work. You know, Cal Yeh and the Germans and, and, and McDessey, you know, doing good work, Nikki, internationally to show that this is the concept of the future. And then it has a higher likelihood of withstanding the, uh, the, the test of time. And, and I do believe principles are principles just like Hip arthroplasty, restore the joint kinematics by restoring the anatomy. It's the same with total knee. And I think once we adopt that and move forward, we're going to find that our forgotten joint scores are going to get like a total hip, that our rehab is going to be quick like a total hip, that our problem patients will go down and our revision rate will go down and uh, everybody's life will be better. Uh, you know, the surgeon and the patients, and you'll be able to go home earlier in the day and sleep better at night. So. That's, that's sort of my, my concluding remarks, at least on the formal slides. And, and uh, so maybe you have another question for me that, that, that we can answer. This is a patient that had bilateral varus deformities. Uh, and as an athlete, we got her back skiing at 11 weeks post-op. And anyway, but here we are making our distal medial measurement. That's six millimeters for the varus knee and eight lateral. And then we have a um, verification sheet that it's already set up. So it tells you the target thickness is gonna be eight millimeters on the unworn and six millimeters on the unworn when there's no cartilage. And so then we will put our mark down if the initial cut will make it six. Now, if it, let's say we need to do a recut, let's say the initial cut was five, we do a recut, yes, how much a millimeter, the final thickness is six. And so you can work through this for your distal cuts and your posterior cuts. And if you get a little confused, you can always go back and just take the pieces and measure them again. If you say, oh, I think I got to release a ligament, go back and double check that you made your cuts right. I mean, you may get yourself in a corner where you really can't go back and change the femoral component position, but at least you recognize that the cut was sort of what was giving you the trouble and it reduces the risk you're going to make that mistake again. And that's just part of the, part of the learning thing. 
But uh, yeah, measuring these cuts and recording them is very helpful. Great. So that brings us to the end of our discussion. And it really was a masterclass from the pioneer himself. And we hope this adds clarity to the concept and the fundamentals of kinematic alignment. And it puts to rest some of the concerns that surgeons may have about kinematic alignment and pretty much ignites the flame amongst arthroplasty surgeons to pursue and at least consider this technique. Dr. Howell, it was an absolute honor and privilege to have you with us today. Thank you so much once again. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here and to share our work for the last 16 years. And I hope it makes your surgeons better surgeons and your patients happier patients.